If there was one weapon that symbolized the military might of Rome, it was the gladius, the short sword the Romans copied from their enemies in what is now modern Spain. The gladius was much shorter than the ancestral swords the Romans used at first. With a blade 70 centimeters or 26 inches long, the weapon was double-edged and pointed, making it perfect for close quarters combat. That's because you could use it to stab or slash, which was much harder to do with a long sword when you're surrounded by enemies on all sides. The Spanish short sword was especially effective when used in tandem with the Roman shield because it gave the soldier an ideal combination of offense and defense. It's interesting that when Paul is talking about spiritual armor in Ephesians 6, the sword of the spirit is the only offensive weapon. Everything else is defensive. Look again. Stand your ground, he writes, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so you'll be fully prepared and hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. As we said from the start of this series, we need protection because there are spiritual adversaries, including Satan. In John 10, Jesus compares himself to a good shepherd who genuinely cares about the sheep he protects. But, he says, the thief comes only to steal and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Whether we're talking about the devil or our own personal demons born of sin and self-centeredness, our enemy wants to steal and destroy. Steal your love, your joy, your security, and anything else that God wants for you. Now, we do not walk like the defeated, but we do have to be vigilant and prepared for attack. And if we're going to fight back, we desperately need the sword of the Spirit because our enemy wants to get in close because that's where he's most lethal. But what exactly is the sword of the Spirit? And this may surprise you. Nobody knows for sure when Ephesians was written, copied, and distributed, but the earliest date is thought to be about 64 AD. And we know that even before that, Paul had written Thessalonians, Galatians, Corinthians, and Romans. But what you may not know is that the first gospel, the Gospel of Mark, was either not written yet or it was written about the same time. But that document would not have traveled to all the churches everywhere at such an early stage. And most scholars say it's almost certain the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John were not written until well after Ephesians. In other words, most early churches had no written record of the life of Jesus and relied heavily on oral tradition. As a matter of fact, most scholars estimate the New Testament wasn't completed until almost 100 AD. And even then, for 200 years after, there were arguments over which books belonged in the Bible and which didn't. My point is that when Paul is talking about the sword of the Spirit, he's not referring to the New Testament because most of it hasn't even been written yet. When the Bible talks about the Word of God, there are several meanings. It usually refers to something that God has decreed will happen, such as when the Hebrews are warned they're going to Babylon into captivity. Other times, the phrase refers to the actual spoken words of God. So, for example, what the Old Testament prophets wrote is often called the Word of God. And in 1 Thessalonians, likely the first New Testament book ever written. Paul says, We thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. 
Likewise, the Apostle Peter equates the writings of Paul with other scripture. He says, His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures. But in the New Testament, the Word of God almost always refers not to Scripture, but to Jesus Himself. So in John 1 we read, In the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word became human and made His home among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. I say all this because it's important to realize that in the original context of the spiritual armor passage, Paul is saying the Word of God, the will, the plan, the revelation of God is a vital weapon. But he's not referring primarily to Scripture, which at that point is still a work in progress. When we refer to the sword of the Spirit, the emphasis must always be on the Spirit, because just as a sword is useless to somebody who doesn't know how to use it, our power comes from the Spirit who guides us into all truth. And often, He uses the written word to do that. But the Trinity is not the Father, Son, and the Holy Scriptures. And if the Bible was all we ever needed, God would not have given us the Spirit in the first place to guide us, mold us, and motivate us. Again, this is not to say the Bible isn't important. Of course it is. But we do ourselves and we do our God a disservice if we assume that Scripture is the only way that God speaks to us or works in our lives today. Going back to his military theme, Paul says the Word of God is like the gladius, a two-edged sword. But again, he's referring primarily to the Word or will of God revealed through the Old Testament which points to Jesus, the Messiah. Paul tells his protege, Timothy, You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they've given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God, or God-breathed, and is useful to teach us what's true, and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, and teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Now we can apply all that to the New Testament, but that wasn't the original intent. So we need to look overall at how God speaks to us and works in our lives. And that includes Scripture, the wrestlings of those who've gone before us in the church, prayer, devotional music, reason, shared experience with other believers, and the everyday guidance of the Holy Spirit in our ordinary circumstances. Through those things, we can identify six distinct benefits. He breathes life into our faith, gives us wisdom, teaches us what's right, makes us realize what's wrong in our lives, corrects us when we're wrong, and equips us to do good. If we're going to fight attacks on our spirituality, each of those things is crucial. But it all begins with what Paul starts with. We have to receive the salvation that comes of trusting in Jesus. That's what should power and define our lives. One more sword analogy. In Hebrews 4, verse 12, it says, The Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes, and He is the one to whom we are accountable. Now that passage is always used to refer to the Bible, and I've quoted it a million times myself in just that way. 
but I think it's pretty clear from the context that the emphasis is not on Scripture, but on the Spirit's ability to reveal the truth to us about ourselves. And yes, He often uses Scripture to do that. But in the past, I came dangerously close to worshiping the Bible instead of keeping the focus on God and His transforming power. And I learned the hard way that you can read all the Scripture you want, but nothing's going to change in your life without the power of the Spirit working in your heart. What's important here is that the Spirit of God cuts well below the surface, past the pretense and posturing to reveal our true thoughts, desires, and motives, because those are the three things that leave us most vulnerable to sin, Satan, and self-deception. So each of us must strip away the public relations and answer three crucial questions. Number one, what do you think about most? What is it that gets your focus? Because that's an indication of what comes first in your heart. What do you think about? Number two, what do you really want out of life? Not what you say you want or what you tell others you want. What do you really want out of life? And number three, why do you do what you do? Is it for God, for others, or for you and the credit those things can bring you? Now, if your answers are spiritual, Paul would say that you're on firm ground and you're equipped to stay there. But if your answers are more secular and materialistic, that's a sign that you need to get closer to God and in tighter formation with your brothers and sisters. Remember what I said earlier about offense and defense? Just as a Roman soldier needed his gladius and shield together to be most effective, we need both the sword of God's revelation and the shield of faith or trust in God to use that sword the way we should. It's not enough to know God's word or will. We need enough faith and trust to use it and live it. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 7. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like someone who built a house on solid rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like someone who builds a house on sand. James says the same thing. He writes, get rid of all the evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. That word is the good news about salvation in Jesus and how we should respond to it with love and obedience to God. But then James adds, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Unlike those in the time of James and Paul, we now have access to the entire New Testament. God reveals himself through Scripture and through Jesus, and we need to know what he wants for us and from us. So to wrap this up, like any sword, we have to learn how to use Scripture effectively. And the word that God has for his church and for each of us as individuals is also revealed through prayer, music, worship, the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our everyday circumstances and our shared experience as a church. We have so many resources to help us fight our spiritual battles, and if we'll use them, we will be protected.
to the hilt. See you next time.